Welcome back to Morbidly Bewitched. In this episode, I take you back in time again to the 1840s. Stay tuned. Please subscribe. There should be a wee button appearing somewhere down here on the screen. And for all of you people that love podcasts, I've also started a channel podcasting. So it's under the same name, Morbidly Bewitched, The Donner Party. The Donner Party was a group of settlers back in the 1840s. And this is during a time whenever an obsession gripped America to move west. Fever was also gripping the nation and thousands of people, thousands of Americans decided to take this long, arduous trip to see what lay in their futures. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. No, you would be so wrong. At the time as well, there was excitement growing in the town and closer towns and regions because this complete moron, Lansford Hastings, a self-proclaimed pioneer, was touting of a shorter route. And people listened, people got really excited. They thought, you know, we're, we've got this, it was like 2,500 miles of deserts and mountain ranges to traverse to get to the west. We're going to listen to this guy, Hastings. So on the 16th of April, 1846, brand new uh, covered wagons were seen leaving Springfield, Illinois for a better life in the West. The Donner Party itself consisted of 87 people, the Donners, the Reeds, the Graves and a couple of other scattered family groups as well in there. Now, the Donners and the Reeds were both extremely wealthy and the Reed family had all of their covered wagons and one in particular was known as the Travelling Palace. It was a two-storey high monstrosity that took eight ox to pull. It boasted a stove, heating system and bunk beds for a luxurious sleep. The majority of people, these 7,000 wagons that headed west as well, all were under the impression they were going to take this new route that had been uh, scouted by Hastings. But there was one major glitch. Hastings hadn't actually travelled the entirety of this so-called route himself. And the parts of it he had travelled, he had done it on horseback. If you hear lots of noise, it's actually the wind coming down the chimney. It's quite a windy day and um, I've wind chimes out the back that I really should have took down before I started this video. <laughs> they eventually reached an area called Independence. Independence was really the last safe point for supplies and sure ground. And on the 27th of June, they reached the next trading post. And it was here that Mr. Reed bumped into an old friend of his, uh, James Clyman. Now, James was on horseback and he had just, he was heading east. He was coming back the way and he had just traveled the suggested route by Hastings and told his friend, do not take that route. Take the normal standard route for heading west. Ignore the Hastings reports because they're false. You will not get wagons across that land. But for whatever reason, Reed ignored his friend's warning. When they reached Little Sandy River, the majority of the group actually decided, you know what, we're going to head 
uh, James Clyman's warning here and at a break off point they decided we're going to hit the old road. We're just going to play it safe and we're going to go by the old route. So all the other wagons turned left at this split point and the Donner party turned right to take the Hastings route. Now it was at this stage whenever they were down to the 20 wagons uh, that they decided collectively as a group to appoint uh, George Donner, the father of the Donner part of the Donner family, as leader of the group, which is where it got its name from, the Donner Party. So the terrain just kept getting worse and worse, and where they were usually making on average ten miles a day, this was ground down to a grueling two miles a day, if they were lucky, because the wagons kept getting stuck in the terrain and they had to dig them out. In August, they eventually reached the Great Salt Lake, which was 80 miles long and took them three weeks longer to traverse than they had originally planned for, which meant they ran out of water, they were running out of food, half of the ox bolted they could the animals as always could foretell danger and they bolted they had to abandon the two-story monstros monstrosity of a traveling palace that the reed zoned that had to go because that was a completely unnecessary weight to troll behind plus it could not cope with the terrain it kept on getting bogged in and in retrospect and looking into it they then realized that Hastings not only had an impassable route for wagons reported but it added an extra 125 miles to the original old route it just couldn't have been a worst case scenario they were an 81 strong group 25 men 15 women and 41 children but because of the excessive amount of time that was added to their journey, they missed the hit of winter by one day when they reached the mountains of Nevada. They were now stuck at the foothills of the Nevada mountains and the edge of Truckee Lake. And they could go no further because as they arrived, a snowstorm of unbelievable magnitude Hit. By the 30th of November, they had completely run out of food. The last of their cattle had been slaughtered and by the 15th of December, they lost their first person to complete malnutrition. They started consuming anything that they could. Ground up bones, leaves, bark, twigs, grass, absolutely anything that could possibly be deemed edible, they ate it. It was at this stage that 10 people from the group, um, they called themselves the Forlorn Hope, uh, headed out for help because they realised we're completely trapped here. We need, we need to move. Um, and during this battle, when these 10 people left, this is when cannibalism started. It would be January 1847 before anybody from this relief crew, the Forlorn Hope, would make it to the other side of the mountains for help. By this stage, there was only two of them. The groups that were left behind were almost worse off because they started to, like I say, cannibalize each other. These were friends and family. This wasn't just a group of strangers, which would have made it somewhat easier these were family members having to eat other family members to survive and the two people that did survive and make it to the other side of the mountain started to then unravel their plight to the rest of the settlers that by then had made it they went the old route they were in town they made it to the west they were fine they were they were quite literally settled um and rescue parties were organized to try and head across the mountains to save the Donner Party or what was left of them. Now, because of the time of year, the relief parties themselves could not head out until February because the mountains were treacherous and even for an extremely fit, well able-bodied team, it was almost a death wish so they had to get extremely well prepared and it, that took time to organize and then see a window of opportunity in the weather to then head out and try and find the donor party what they came across was 48 
people out of the entire group clinging to life by the skin of their teeth. By the time they were all rescued, 46 survived. Another two had died in the space of time of the rescue taking place. But the description of the camp itself was something that would fuel nightmares because most people had went insane and they described coming across hearts roasting on spits above fires, body parts strewn about the campsite. Two of the Donner children had been consumed. Mrs Graves lay out in the open. She had been stripped of her flesh and one of her children sat beside her with her wee hand on her mum's body, what was left of it, in tears. And there was hair, body parts, limbs, just everywhere. There was also bloody footprints that would have led from body parts into the sheltered camps. Out of the 46 sorry souls that survived, the Donners themselves were the worst hit. All four adults from the Donner family died along with four of their children, with only two children out of the Donner family surviving. The place itself turned into a tourist attraction, wouldn't you know? Because that area where the two shelters were just at the edge of Truckee Lake was actually extremely common ground for the gold mining, which meant it went from this place of complete desolation where you you were just at despair, you couldn't get out of it, you were stuck, to somewhere that quite an awful lot of people went to, to mine gold and also walk along the paths and remember the, the history that unfolded there. And that's when it became known as the Donner Pass and trinkets and pieces and items from the camp itself would have been sold as souvenirs. Lovely. Now I've tried my best to condense the, the most important parts of this story down into a short video because this is an extremely well documented tragic event. This went down in history as one of the best documented tragic events considering it was the 1840s. Um, because along the way, an awful lot of the family members kept notes, they kept diaries. The people who carried out the rescue mission, that was documented. The entire timeline of events right up until their rescue was extremely well recorded and reported. So there you go. Moral of the story is, don't take shortcuts. Be kind to animals and I will see you soon.